Good to see you all tonight. We continue our studies in the book of Acts. Some exciting things happening in the life of Timothy and Paul and Silas. And we've already seen a great deal happened in the life of Peter. Though now as we've moved into the second half of the book of Acts, the principal figure that we have in view is the Apostle Paul. As you know, we see a transition period in the book of Acts. As we begin the opening chapters, the entire church is Jewish. 3,000 men saved on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 Jewish men, not merely Jewish men, but they were devout Jewish men from all over the world. 18 different languages are mentioned in the opening chapters of Acts that they were speaking and that they understood. And then we move to Acts chapter 8 and we find a man who is half Jewish and half Gentile and we find a man who is neither male nor female and we find a man who is an Ethiopian eunuch uh, we find moving to Acts chapter 10 we find some Samaritans uh, excuse me Romans in Acts chapter 10 hundred percent Gentiles we move to Acts chapter 16 as we get to the end of this chapter we'll find a female head of the household we find a whole group of different very interesting people as we move through the book of Acts as God is expanding the outreach of the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight we're in Acts chapter 16 looking at verses 4 and 5 establishing the church in the faith. Why is it that the church didn't die on the vine? Why is it that the, the seeds that were initially planted didn't just wither up? There was intense persecution. We've already seen that as we've been moving through these uh, first half of the, of the book, there was intense persecution. The Apostle Paul, of course, he, he stuck it out, but after all, he's only one guy. And he died. He was put to death. Why is it that the church continued to grow? Now, we know the divine answer is God sovereignly superintended and made sure that it did. But what was the procedure, the method, the tactics, if you will, by which we see the church not only growing, but becoming solid, being established in the faith. Rather significant. We don't see it deviating. We see it being established. We don't see that false doctrine took it over. We see that it was established. There was false doctrine. There were heretics. There were apostates. They dealt with that problem in Acts chapter 15 at the council in Jerusalem. There were people already in the early church trying to divide the church and destroy it. There were those who were trying to place it back under the law, some for salvation, some for sanctification. There was a humongous issue about the issue of circumcision. It's one of the, the biggest crisis problems that we find all the way through the book of Acts and in many of the New Testament epistles because the, the touch of Judaism was so very, very strong on the early church and thus the desire to get back under certain aspects of the law instead of understanding that we're under grace. There was this push for the external rather than for the internal. How important it is for us to discover that what God is most pleased with is the inner man of the heart, not the external things that we do. The inner man of the heart will control the things that we do, but the things that we do will not change our hearts. The change has to come from the inside and work its way out as the Spirit of God begins to cleanse us and motivate us and direct us and strengthen us because there is, as Paul says, much opposition. So we're in Acts chapter 16. You recall what we studied last week, the first three verses there. He came to Derbe and Lystra and behold a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And we saw that Timothy, of course, was 
perhaps the most important result of Paul's second missionary journey. It's hard to really say that because on this missionary journey, Paul planted so many churches that were soundly established in the faith that that entire region of what today is known as Turkey became known as the land of the thousand churches. Most of those, of course, have been destroyed. There are many ruins that are still found there, but when Islam swept across Turkey, uh, they killed those who were believers. Either people had to convert to Islam or they had to die. That happened in North Africa as well. When Islam uh, swept across North Africa, the church in North Africa had been a very, very strong church, uh, but it was wiped out uh, almost to non-existence. Very important for us to understand that Satan does not like the spread of the gospel. And one of the many tools that he has used over the centuries to destroy Christian testimony and witness is Islam. Suzanne stuck a thing in my box today about how Islam is taking over uh, the Netherlands and various portions of Europe and how huge numbers of Muslims are developing almost ghetto type communities uh, really for the purpose of ultimately destroying all of Europe and bringing it under Dar al-Islam, which is the house of Islam. Uh, you heard me preach about that a couple of years ago when I talked about uh, the impact that the original text of the Hebrew and Greek Bibles had upon Muhammad, the founder of Islam. There was a strong church in Ethiopia at that time, and Muhammad fled to Ethiopia during one of his flights and studied and learned much whereby if you read the Quran you will discover that there are over 50 biblical names and stories though they have been twisted in the Quran. Very interesting to see how Satan takes the word of God and how he twists it and then brings it back to destroy the very people from whom it came, the Jews and the Christians. Lots to be said on that. But anyway, so here we find that Timothy, in that central region of Turkey where the Apostle Paul was carrying the gospel, uh, the son of a Jewess and a Gentile came to Christ. We find that his mother and his grandmother were believing Jews. We talked about that last week, and Paul makes mention of that over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, where he talks about how... Uh, the faith that first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. We talked about how this would make him a target for Jewish criticism had he not been circumcised. And Paul circumcised him, though he did not circumcise Titus. We're specifically told that he did not circumcise Titus, who was 100% Gentile, because Titus did not need that for a testimony to Jews, but Timothy for a testimony to Jews did need that. We learned many things about the childhood of Timothy last week. We saw that his mother and grandmother had taught him the Old Testament scriptures. Most of the New Testament, of course, hadn't been written at that time. But they taught him the Old Testament scriptures, particularly those scriptures that relate to the Messiah, the promised Messiah. Because salvation by faith has always been through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, they were looking forward to him. They were not saved by works in the Old Testament. They were not saved by the law in the Old Testament. The people who were saved in the Old Testament were those who believed. Even Abraham himself, when God took Abraham and gave him the covenant and showed him what his descendants would be like and what the Messiah, his one important descendant, would be like, it says, Abraham believed and the Lord counted it unto him for righteousness. And that word counted there, uh, logizomai in the Greek New Testament, where that passage is quoted, is the word for imputation. God transferred righteousness to the account of Abraham because of his faith, not because of his works, because righteousness was imputed to him even before his circumcision. The scripture makes a very big point about that. His righteousness did not come by circumcision. His righteousness did not come by works. His righteousness in the eyes of God came by faith. He believed what God said. He looked into the future as God revealed it to him there and believed in the coming Messiah. 
and you discover that is true of each of the Old Testament believers, that they were believing the word of God, they were looking forward to the promises of God, they believed the promises concerning the coming Messiah. And so that is why we know what was being taught to Timothy, because of what is said here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we're told that uh, in verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, now here's the important phrase, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus, or in Christ Jesus. The scriptures that Timothy studied, he did not have a New Testament, it wasn't written yet. The scriptures that his grandmother and his mother had taught him were the Old Testament scriptures, and they made him wise unto salvation, and were not just a general wisdom unto salvation, just sort of, he believes in God, well James tells us the devil believes in God and trembles. That's not what saves you, believing that there's a God is not what saves you. Believing that there's a God is not what gets you to heaven. Most of the religions of the world believe that there is some kind of a God out there. Some of them believe in many gods. Some believe in only one God, like Islam. Some believe in only one God, like Judaism. But it's the God of the scriptures. Thank you for the emphasis. <laughs> it's the God of the scriptures. And it's the God in scriptures who has revealed the coming Messiah, and for us, the Messiah who has come. Faith which is in Christ Jesus. We must never forget that as we look at those portions of text. Now, if you were stuck with just an Old Testament, for whatever reason, you had just an Old Testament, or suppose you had the opportunity to witness to someone who did not believe in the New Testament, believed in the Old Testament, for example, if you're witnessing to a Jew, could you lead that person to Christ using only the Old Testament. You should be able to do so. You should know your Old Testament well enough that you know that Christ is found in all the scriptures. You remember what Jesus said to the disciples as he was walking on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection? was probably his uncle and aunt, though we cannot prove that for sure, but there are a lot of good indications that it was his uncle and aunt who were heading back to Emmaus after the crucifixion. And they were all discouraged, and they were sad and defeated. And Jesus appears to them and walks with them as they talked and said, why are you sad? And they said, haven't you heard what's been going on in Jerusalem? I mean, Jesus of Nazareth was here and and we thought that he would be the one who would redeem Israel. They had studied their Old Testament scriptures somewhat. They had thought that Jesus was the Messiah. But then they saw his death. They saw him wrapped up. They saw him stuck in the tomb, in the rock, and the stone rolled away uh, in front of it. And they decided he must not be. What was the problem? They didn't know the Old Testament well enough. They didn't know, for example, Psalm 16, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. They did not understand that the Old Testament prophesied the death of the Messiah they did not understand, as Philip did when he, he spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch on the, the road through Gaza back to Ethiopia, that Isaiah 53 deals with Christ on the cross, or Psalm 22. Could you take your Old Testament scripture and lead someone to Christ? Do you remember what Jesus, it says about Jesus when they doubted? It says, he opened unto them the scriptures. There was no New Testament written. He showed them himself in all the scriptures. I know some of you remember I preached, I forget how many months ago it was, we went over that Christ in all the scriptures and we went through every book of the Old Testament and showed you where Jesus is found in each one of the Old Testament books. Incredible number of prophecies. 
Timothy came to Christ through the Old Testament scriptures. I hope that you could do that and share Christ with someone who has never heard but who knows the Old Testament scriptures. Of course, Paul mentions the fact that Timothy had seen those persecutions that he endured at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra uh, because uh, he writes that to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We know that the Christian life, and we talked about that to some extent last week, is not for sissies, it's for men and women of courage because all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And Paul says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Every one of us will suffer a little here. But the time may come here in the United States, and I expect that it will, when the persecution will get much more intense than anything that we've ever seen here. If you know anything about church history, if you go to any part of the world where the gospel has met a beachhead, you will understand that Satan and his demonic forces have opposed the gospel to the point of putting Christians to death. It's fascinating to read those missionary stories, especially as you see God penetrating the darkness. But also, you get excited as you read about the different things that the missionaries had to go through. The different things that happened to the missionaries. The times that they were in prison. You think about Adoniram Judson in Burma. You think about John Patton, another Presbyterian missionary, on the islands of the New Hebrides and the headhunter cannibals coming after him. We look at that as exciting children's stories, but folks, that happened to real people because they believed and proclaimed the gospel of Christ. And we don't because we don't want to experience that. We hold back at work, we hold back in our neighborhoods, we hold back among our friends, we hold back among our acquaintances. We don't want to offend anybody. This morning there was a young man here with his family who had just been told by his parents-in-law that he could never come back to their home again because he has insisted on sharing the gospel of Christ. Do you understand what it will cost? It should not make you afraid. It's merely a, a heads up so that you'll be prepared and not be surprised. Because if you know Jesus Christ, and if you love him with all your heart, you will want to talk about him. I remember when dear Judy was still with us. And you know, everywhere I went, I always wanted to talk about her. Because I loved her. And everywhere I went, somehow I... I don't know how it happened, but there always seemed to come some point in the conversation where it was significant and appropriate to talk about her and about our dear children whom she had taught and trained and raised and what joy they brought to our hearts. There were many contexts in which people didn't appreciate that. But you know, I talked about her because I loved her. If you really love Jesus, you will talk about him. And you'll talk about him with joy and not with grimness. You'll talk about him with thanksgiving and not with despair. You'll talk about him with peace and contentment and not with how much he's failed you. The one you love is one that you will talk about. I know that from personal experience. Last week we also mentioned that although the entire code of chivalry is not found here in these two passages that we read out of Timothy, but Paul gives Timothy the same type of instruction that was copied in the code of chivalry by the knights gallant in ancient England. 
Ancient England, of course, had the gospel in it. And it made an impact in the way people lived. Now, they didn't live as nicely as we live. They didn't have as many conveniences as we have. They were a lot dirtier than we are. And many times we think about the knights in shining armor. The armor was polished, but they weren't very. But they had a code of chivalry. And in that code of chivalry, we find the same ideas that Paul gives to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be fearless and strong in battle. Be gentle, courageous, and patient. Care for the weak and oppressed. Rescue the captives. At all times, treat women and girls with all gallantry, decorum, and moral purity. Honor and death is more valuable than a life of cringing cowardice. Oh, how American men need to learn to hear that. Paul had instructed Timothy, his little protege, to be a man of integrity, a man of honor, a man of moral purity. And then Paul passed his sword to that young man whom he had trained, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. At his death, that's what Paul is doing here in 2 Timothy, which is what we might call Paul's swan song. Paul's about to die, and he's passing it on to Timothy. And he has fully trained Timothy. The teacher now knows that he can entrust the responsibility to the one whom he's taught. Like the judo master, or the jujitsu master, or the karate master now has a student who can take his place. Paul writes, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. You've learned it all, Timothy. I've taught you everything that I know. That's saying something. The apostle Paul was a student of Gamaliel, one of the seven greatest rambans, that is rabbis, in Jewish history. And Paul was his personal disciple. And Paul said to Timothy, Thou hast fully known my doctrine. Timothy had learned it well. And then he says, And you've also fully known my manner of life. Timothy, you've not just got head knowledge. You fully know how to put what you've got in your head into practice. Now folks, I think that none of us, myself included, know fully how to put what we know in our heads into practice. That's because we don't use what we've got. Here before the service this evening, I got here a little early, so I was dabbling around on the piano. You know, I know a lot more <laughs> than I can actually play anymore. It's been years and years and years since I practiced. You know, someone was once asked, Archer Rubinstein, one of the greatest pianists of this past century, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And he said, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> it's the only way. He also made the comment at one point, if I don't practice for one day, I know it. If I don't practice for two days, my wife knows it. If I don't practice for three days, the world knows it. If you don't take what you know in your head and put it into practice, you will very soon become incompetent in living the Christian life and in bearing testimony concerning your faith. Timothy, you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, the way to live. You've fully known my purpose. You know why you're doing what you're doing. Do you know why you're doing what you're doing? A lot of us go through the mechanics. We go through the rote things that we've memorized. We just sort of, every morning we get up at a certain time and we yawn. And then we put two feet on the floor, and then we scrabble down to the bathroom and brush our teeth and comb our hair or take a shower or whatever you do first thing in the morning. And then we fix our breakfast, and then we hobble off to work or whatever activity we plan. And we don't even think about it. 
Do you ever stop in the morning and consider what is God's purpose for my life today? I consider that every morning when I get up. I know that I have one less day of life to live. One less night of sleep before I die. My life has been truncated. It has been shortened. What can I do to maximize the potential that God has given me for the glory of Christ? Because soon I will stand before him and as the scripture says, give an account for the things that I have done in the body. Timothy, you have fully known my purpose. Do you know your purpose? Do you focus on your purpose every day? Not just do you focus on, well, I got to do a job today. Do you focus on the purpose for which God put you into this world? <clears throat> the purpose that he enables you and strengthens you and empowers you and gives you joy in accomplishing. Timothy, you've fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith. Ah, Timothy, you'll not make it unless you learn to walk by faith. I won't make it unless I learn to walk by faith. You won't make it unless you learn to walk by faith. You've seen me, Timothy. You've seen faith in action. You've seen what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. You've seen what it means to trust God for provisions when they're not there. You've seen what it means to be in shipwreck a night and a day in the deep and praying that God will give you more opportunity to witness. I happen to have done that, says Paul. You see what it's like to walk by faith when you're in the middle of false brethren. You see what it's like to walk by faith when you've been beaten with rods and received the cat of nine tiles 39 times. You've got the lashes on your back. Do you know what it means to walk by faith? When everything goes wrong? You've fully known my long suffering. We talked about that a little this morning. And it's connected here to charity. That's agape. You've fully known my agape. Do you remember what we talked about this morning with agape? How God's kind of love, agape love, impacts and informs every other kind of love. Eros, within the context of marriage. Phileo, within the context of friendship. Storgo, in the context of of family love. You've fully known it, Timothy. You have fully seen what it is to love the brethren. You've fully known my patience. You've fully known my persecutions. You've fully known my afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra what persecutions I endured. Do you remember one of the character qualities of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we looked at this morning? Charity, agape, endures all things. Why do you think Paul did what he did? Why do you think he was able to endure what he endured? Agape 
endures all things. Do you see how the scripture is a unit? These are not isolated teachings of Paul. These are an interconnected, interwoven life that a Christian lives because he loves and because he is empowered by Christ. And Timothy had fully, not partially, Timothy had fully known it. The teacher had taught well. He hands off the sword to the young squire. He causes him to kneel and taps him on the shoulder. And the young squire rises a knight. And the sword is carried to the next generation. It has been entrusted to you. Faithful men who passed it to faithful men, who passed it to my father, who passed it to me, and I'm passing it to you. But we talked about that in detail last week. All right. Let me summarize quickly what we said about love last week, because I have much more I'd like to say tonight in the passage before us. I'm sorry that I spent so much time reviewing. You remember that you always do more for true love than you will for some little rule, because the rule makes you do it. That mentality that, oh well, I've got to obey this rule, will always make you into a minimalist. You will always do as little as possible. But when you have genuine love, you will become a creative maximalist. You will always do more than is required, and you will do it in the most creative way that you can discover for the one whom you love. That's why we saw love is offended is always worse than law offended, and we saw that we love God because he first loved us. Now that brings us tonight to verses 4 and 5, establishing the church in faith. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So what does God require for a church to really be established in the faith. As we look at the New Testament pattern of establishing churches in the faith, which are set out actually in two verses, right here for us, in these two verses, some very important things stand out. In fact, <clears throat> at least 22 things, I'm sure there are more, but as I was studying these verses, I discovered at least 22 things. Now look at how short those verses are. I discovered at least 22 things that can be learned about what it takes to establish a church in the faith from just those two verses. Let me give you a little trick as to how to do that kind of a thing. Note what we learn by putting an emphasis on each different word in this very short text. The first thing we learn is that the process was active and not passive. They went through the cities. They didn't sit around at home and just strategize. They didn't sit around at home and just pray, though prayer is essential. They didn't just sit around at home and think, well, I'll send some money to the mission board this month. I don't know how little I can get away with and still get whatever it is they're offering. They went! Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Judea and Samaria, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You don't get from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth unless you go. Now God has given us our own Jerusalem. You live in a neighborhood. So do I. Have you ever invited your immediate neighbors to anything here at the church? I have. Not very much response. 
but I do it. Do you ever talk to people in your Judea? For example, when you're at the grocery store, when you're standing in line somewhere, when you're walking through the park. I do. Don't get much response. Sometimes I get some pretty bad response. Do you ever reach out to Samaria? Somebody that might be really scary, like you're at an airport and somebody sits down next to you. Do you strike up a conversation about the gospel? Or you're on the plane and you're going to sit next to this person for the next two hours. Do you ever open your Bible and say, Do you know what I just discovered here this last week in my private devotions? And then have you have them look at you like, Who is this weirdo? And push their button and ask the hostess to move to a different seat. Folks, have you ever gone to the uttermost part of the earth. Some have been on short-term mission trips. But have you ever gone there and lived for any extensive period of time? I have. And my heart breaks for the people with whom I have shared Christ. And they've turned their back. You say, but you're the preacher. Yeah. And you're the people to whom the sword has been passed. You shall be my witnesses. The very first thing we learn about establishing the church in the faith is you have to have a church to establish. You have to go. The process is active, not passive. They went through the cities. Let's place the emphasis on a different word in that verse. The process was systematic and methodical. They went through the cities. They didn't go around the cities. They didn't sit on the mountaintop and look at the cities through binoculars. They didn't merely send a mass mailing to the cities. They went through the cities. There was going to be personal contact. And they did it systematically and methodically. Let's place the emphasis on a different word in that verse. They went through the cities. The process was comprehensive. They went where the people were. Now, back at the beginning, when we were talking about the Apostle Paul's strategy of missions, we saw that what he did was he went to key cities. He went to cities that were crossroads. He went to cities where there would be people with multiple languages and who spoke more than one language. He went to places where he could first find a synagogue and establish a beachhead and the synagogues were in the cities and then from that beachhead he would reach out to the people in that city so that he would have a place to bring those people that trusted Christ and establish them with a group who already knew the Old Testament and all the prophecies concerning the Messiah. The plan was comprehensive. Let me emphasize a fourth word here. It's a tiny little word. The process was continuous. Look at that two little word, as. As they went through the cities. The process was a continuous process. There was a constant movement going on and a constant impact being made. 
Ah, here is another very important word. The process was a function of teamwork. Did you see the word they? They went through the cities. You know what we see in the New Testament is that in the early church it was a team of men who went out to spread the gospel in each instances. Each leader who went to spread the good news had somebody with him to help him. They went. The book of Ecclesiastes talks about how important it is to have two and, if possible, three. One may be overcome, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. If there are two and one falls, the other will be able to lift him up. It's very hard in ministry to be alone. They went through the cities. Notice something else about the word they. It's pointing to some specific individuals. The process was accomplished by a seasoned and gifted team of men as they went through the cities. That's Paul and Silas. That's who we're talking about here. It's not merely teamwork, but it is a team of seasoned and gifted men. Notice something else that we discover as we just emphasize individual words. The process was through carefully prepared communications. They weren't talking off the cuff. They weren't making it up as they went along. They were not doing what modern missions has fallen into today, where they were doing cultural contextualization. Have you heard that term? That is a big buzz stuff in modern missions, where you make it, quote, relevant to the culture instead of proclaiming the message. God did not call us to make it relevant. The fact that it is true is what makes it relevant. The fact that it is the only way of salvation makes it relevant. You cannot make it relevant by soft peddling it. You cannot make it relevant by making it fit the culture and its preconceived ideas and language, such as many of the modern translation to Muslims, which remove the concept of Jesus being the Son and God being the Father. God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And if God calls him the Son, who are we to change it to this is my nice prince or some other idiot translation like that? There was carefully prepared communication. They delivered them the decrees for to keep. They didn't make it up as they went along. They didn't contextualize it. Notice something else. We emphasize a different word here. The process was targeted. You know, if you shoot at nothing, you will hit it every time. If you shoot at nothing, you will hit it every time. You heard about the man who was going through the mountains of Appalachia, and everywhere he went, he saw these bullseyes and in the center of the bullseyes, dead center every one of the bullseyes, there was a perfect bullet hole. And they were everywhere. They were on trees, they were on the sides of houses, they were on the sides of barns. He found a dead horse and there was a bullseye and there was a bullet right straight through the middle of the bullseye. 
And he came into town and he began to ask around. He said, who is the incredible marksman who's been hitting all these bullseyes? I mean, everywhere I go, it's perfect shots. And I said, oh, that's the town idiot. He said, the town idiot? They said, he's the perfect marksman? I said, oh, no, no. He shoots first and paints the bullseye later. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> if you don't know your target, if you shoot at nothing, you will hit it every time. Did you notice here the process was targeted? They delivered them, native case to them. He delivered them the decrees for to keep. There was a specific targeted group who got the decrees delivered to them. We need to make sure that we're not just sort of helter-skelter in the way that we witness. There should be a target. There should be preparation before we go to the target. There should be prayer. We'll see a little bit later there should be fasting. There should be time that we spend with God and in His Word so that we have the right bullet. There was a targeted contact. Number nine, the process was content oriented. Oh, how important that is. The, the process was content oriented, not fuzzy feel good mush. It says they delivered them the decrees. That's content oriented. That's not mush. Nobody ever heard of a decree that was mush. Nobody ever read something that Caesar decreed that they said, what kind of fuzzy mush is that? They delivered them the decrees. Notice something else right out of that same word there. The content was extensive. It says decrees plural. It doesn't say decree. Now, if you look back at Acts chapter 15, which was dealing with that issue of circumcision, you would have thought, well, there's a single decree. No, there were so many things that were connected to that. And we've seen Paul, as he dissected that discussion that happened at the Council of Jerusalem, when we look at the book of Galatians, we learn a lot about what happened at the Council of Jerusalem. We learn the implications of it. We learn the applications of it. We discovered that there are things in that discussion that took place at Jerusalem with the apostles and the elders. We discovered that there are things that impacted the very foundation of the Christian church. It was extensive, the decrees, plural. The eleventh thing that we learn. The process was mandatory. It was not a bunch of optional suggestions. It says they delivered them the decrees for to keep. It was not optional. It was not the big suggestions from Jerusalem. Or if you wish how to live a happy and meaningful life. It says they delivered them the decrees for to keep. It process was mandatory. Number 12, the process was divinely ordained through human instruments. The process was divinely ordained through human instruments. They gave them the decrees for the keep that were ordained. Number 13, and I see my time is running out. I've got 22 of these. <laughs> the process was authoritative. And it was from a qualified authority. The process was authoritative and it was from a qualified authority. It says that were ordained of the apostles and elders. That's authoritative. And these men were qualified authority. Number 14. The process recognized multiple levels of authority. It's apostles and elders. It doesn't say from the apostles and the elders confirmed it. It wasn't like a bifurcated house. It was multiple levels of authority, the apostles and elders. Number 15, the process was standardized. 
In other words, it was not a different standard for different groups, a different group of authorities for different groups. It was the apostles and elders who handed down the entire ball of wax. The process was not only standardized, the process was centralized. The apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. Number 17, the process was methodical. Oh, how often we do things haphazardly. We sort of do them on the run. There's no organization, no system, no thought behind it. We just sort of scatterbrained, run out there and do. We should be doing, but notice the process was methodical. This process of establishing the church in the faith. Look at the next two words. And so. In other words, by this means. It was both methodological and methodical. And so, by this means, the churches were established. And that brings us to the next one, number 18. The process produced, ah, oh, how we love this. This is what modern manufacturing is all about. This is what McDonald's is all about. This is what Chick-fil-A is all about, and Burger King is all about, and every fast food restaurant that you can imagine. So that anywhere you go in the United States, you know what you're going to get. The process produced consistent results. The process produced consistent results. And so were the churches, plural, established. This had an impact that was felt across the entire board. Consistent results. Number 19. The process produced stability. And so were the churches established. That means planted firmly. Put on solid ground. All of the wavering parts removed. All of the weak parts strengthened. All of the missing parts added. And so were the churches established. It produced stability. Now here we come to something that's very important. In fact, critical. Number 20. The process resulted in a defined body of truth it says and so are the churches established in the faith the process resulted in a defined body of truth called the faith in fact every place in the new testament where the words the faith are found where faith is connected to the definite article the every place no exceptions. Every place that that combination is found, a specific articulated body of truth is under consideration. Every place where you find the faith or the faith. Every place an articulated body of truth is under consideration. As we examine all those occurrences, we discover that the principal core of this body of truth is what is called the gospel. That is, the body of truth concerning who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Who Jesus is, that he is both undiminished God and sinless man, the God-man, the one who is uniquely joined forever, one person with two natures, what's been called the hypostatic union, one person with two natures inseparable, through all of eternity, he is both God and man. You find him presented that way all through the scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament. Who Jesus is and what he did. That is, the elements of his work, which are his substitutionary death for our sins, which was proved by his burial that he actually died, and his bodily resurrection from the dead, proving that his death 
accomplished what he promised that it would accomplish. If Jesus is still dead in some rock grave over in Israel somewhere, you're without hope and so am I. And what I'm doing here tonight is a waste of our time. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, we are of all men most miserable. The resurrection is central to the gospel. It is at the core of our existence. The substitutionary death of Christ, the bodily resurrection. But if Jesus is only a man, he can't die for your sins. If he's even an angel, he can't die for your sins. Because it's an infinite death. If he's not God... He cannot give you eternal life. How could a finite creature give you something that's eternal? You see, the core content of the faith first centers around the gospel, who Jesus is and what he did. But the, this, the faith also includes what must be our appropriate response to that definitive body of truth. In other words, one, how do we respond? Two, what is a legitimate response and what is not a legitimate response? And three, what are the effects of each possible response? Now you know that we are called to respond. The gospel is not our response. The gospel is the objective truth concerning Christ. But we are called upon to respond to that objective truth. And our response is critical. What did Paul tell the, uh, the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16? End of the passage that we're going to be looking at, just a few more verses down the road. Paul gets thrown in jail at Philippi because he's preaching the gospel. And... You know the story how he and Silas have been beaten, they've been thrown in jail, they've been chained to the wall, and God sends an earthquake and not only looses their bonds, but everybody's bonds. The doors of the prison fall open. The jailer thinks that everybody must have escaped. He draws his sword to commit Harry Carey. Probably never heard that term, but he's going to commit suicide, jam himself through with the sword, because he knew what would happen to him if he, as the, as the guard, as the keeper of the prison, let any prisoner escape. It was death. And he did not want to die the way the Romans would put him to death. And Paul cried out to him and said, Do thyself no harm, we are all here. And the jailer, trembling, called for light and sprang in. And what was the question he asked? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There has to be a response to the gospel. He had been listening to them sing all night long. And they were not singing, Mary had a little lamb. They were not singing the latest Beatles song. They were not sitting in there singing some kind of a twiddle dee twiddle dee dum kind of melody or moaning and groaning. And they said, here's the appropriate response. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Too many people leave off that last phrase when they quote that verse. Say everything that Paul said to the Philippian jailer. And we find later that the jailer brings them in, washes their wounds, and not only he believes, but it says, and his house believed. Dear people, that is a defined body of truth. How do you respond? What is the legitimate response? What's not a legitimate response? Rejection is obviously not a, uh, a legitimate response. What are the results of each possible response? For those who believe, heaven. For those who do not believe, hell. Number 21. The process resulted in solid church growth. It says, and increased in number daily. They increased in number. Oh, how we would love to see that here. 
there was solid church growth. Now there are two aspects to church growth. Number one, numerical growth, which is what happened here. And the second aspect of church growth is spiritual growth. God has to bring about both types of church growth. You can't have either one without the working of the Holy Spirit. Without the clear work of the Holy Spirit, neither type of church growth will occur. Most of us, though, unfortunately, tend to focus on numerical growth. But God is just as concerned about the spiritual growth of those who are already his children. Are you ready for numerical growth? Do you know that numerical growth means responsibility for you? Parents who are not yet parents pray that God will give them children. At least believing parents pray that. When Judy and I got married, we prayed that God would give us as many children as he would. We were a little bit prepared. I'm glad he didn't give us all 13 at once. <laughs> we were a little bit prepared. You know what? As soon as he gave us one, we didn't just sit back and say, great, let's get number two. We won't worry about number one over here. Let's get number two. Do you know something? We had some responsibilities. We had some obligations. We had obligations that lasted not only during the day, but at lasted during the night. We had to feed babies. We had to burp babies. We had to change diapers on babies. We had to give babies clothes. We had to give babies shelter. We had to protect babies from things that would hurt them. We had to take babies to doctors when they got sick. And other babies began to come along and the compound problem began to grow and grow and grow. But you know, there was something exciting that happened in the midst of all of that. Some of those first babies, Natanya, Ariel, Philemon, Nehemiah, Hillary, as they began to grow, they began to learn from us as adults what you're supposed to do with babies. And so those children, as they grew, began to participate in the numerical growth that was happening by helping with the physical and spiritual growth of the children who came into our home. Dear people, you want numerical growth. I've heard comments here that, oh, the reason we need to have more people is so that we can get more money. If God wants the church to live, there will be the money that's needed to keep it afloat. But if God brings people here for numerical growth, that means that you, who claim to be spiritually mature, suddenly have responsibilities. Suddenly have responsibilities. It's not to make your life easier that numerical growth would occur, should God bless us with that. It is so that you might become active in helping raise the children. Oh, I know many of them would be adults, but in the faith, they are but children. Solid church growth. They increased in number daily. Number 22, the process resulted in rapid church growth and increased in number daily. Folks, could we handle it? If every day God added one new person to this church, just one, there was rapid church growth. 
Now, I know my time is up. But whether you realize it or not, what I've just done here is I've just taken you through a process that's called inductive Bible study. I use that process frequently. I, I like this particular passage because it's short and it has so many things in it and I can show you how to do it from this passage where you take each word and say, what is God telling me through that word? Every word of God is pure. That's what the scripture says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus lets us know that not a jot or a tittle shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled. A jot is a yod. That's the smallest Hebrew letter. A tittle is a foot on the side of a letter. It's the difference, for example, between a chet, which is shaped like that, and a tav, which is exactly the same shape, except it's got a little foot off to the side. A ch sound versus a t sound. Not a jot or a tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. You can take each word and you can look at it in its context. Don't look at it outside of its context. Look at it in its context and you will gain incredible insight into what God is telling you in Scripture. You just went through an inductive Bible study. Wish I had more time to talk about that right now. Now, there are a lot more observations that we could make about the process of establishing a church by looking at the surrounding context. I won't do much of this, but I'll just give you a, a sample. For example, the role of elders in church growth. It talks about the apostles and elders. We could do a study on apostles, just with that word apostles. See where apostles show up. What do they do? How do they function? What do they work with? We could do the same thing with elders. And how do they relate to church growth? You know, up to this point in the book of Acts, the elders of the church have been mentioned eight times. Now, there are some other elders that are mentioned in the early chapters of Acts, which are the elders that are part of the Sanhedrin. They're not elders in the church. But up to this point, the elders of the church have been mentioned eight times. What can you learn by going back to each of those previous times that they're mentioned in the book of Acts to understand more about what's happening here when the apostles and elders, together as a joint group, send the Paul and Silas out with this decree? which is a mandatory decree. What could you learn from that? If you followed through in that study, you would discover that the church elders have prominent roles in church establishing leadership. Remember we read Acts 4.23. There were five keys in Acts 4.23. It says, When they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them unto the Lord on whom they had believed. The five keys were number one, proper qualifications of elders. Number two, prayer. Number three, fasting. Curious, when was the last time you fasted to know the will of God? I won't tell you when or how much I do, but I am not preaching through my hat. You don't know when I fast. I don't appear any different, and Jesus said that's the way it's supposed to be. But he said, the time will come when you will fast. That was part of it here. Number four, commissioning. Number five, genuine faith. When they had ordained the elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. You know, as Paul and Silas traveled back to each of those churches, they had already ordained elders in each church who were involved in teaching, training, leadership, troubleshooting, prayer, fasting, discipleship, setting an example, service, diligence, faithfulness, consistent burden-bearing, responsibility, and spiritual warfare. If we were to apply that insight while doing our inductive Bible study, it would take us to many different passages. For example, it would take us to Paul's address to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, showing the dangers that can happen in elder bodies. It would take us to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, where Paul lists the 22 mandatory qualifications for elders to help avoid the dangers that arose at Ephesus. 
It would take us to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. Peter was the chief apostle. And he considered himself an elder who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. <laughs> the message tonight was establishing the church in the faith. Establishing the church in the faith includes many more things than we're able to cover tonight. It originally included the writing of the New Testament. It now includes the systematic teaching of both Old Testament and New Testament. It included the establishment of what the believers viewed as a covenant community, where each person cared for and helped others in the bond of love who were part of that covenant community. It included fervent prayer. Do you come to prayer meeting? It included a hedge of protection around the children and provision to give them a truly Christian education in the faith including in the New Testament homeschooling as we see with Lois and Eunice teaching young Timothy. <laughs> oh, there's so much more that could be added. I encourage you to continue in your inductive Bible study on what it takes to establish the church in the faith. I hope that's important to you. And as you do that Bible study, perhaps you'll discover, yes, discover, an exciting role that you can play as you yield to the Spirit of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your gracious word and for its power. How we thank you that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If it was left up to us, it wouldn't happen. And yet you have given us your Holy Spirit you have given to us, if we will but take it, the wisdom of your word. You have given to us, if we will but exercise it, faith. You have given to us all that is necessary to accomplish the job that you sent us to do. You have given to us your eternal divine agape love which undergirds everything that we do that is successful. Help us, Father, to take advantage of the tools that you've put at our disposal and the empowerment with which you have gifted each one of us that we might see this church grow, not just numerically, but that we might grow spiritually so that we will be ready for numerical growth when you send it. We pray these things, Father, in the name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 449, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. We'll stand to sing all.